Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a segment about turkey idioms, a segment about the word cornucopia, and a follow-up on the word moist. But first, if you're starting to think about your syllabus for next term, check out my LinkedIn Learning Better Writing videos. I was so happy last week because I ran into a former colleague from the School of Journalism where I used to be a professor, and he had watched the videos and said he loved them. He said they're great. I was so happy. If your students need help with active voice or commas or other basic writing topics, you can play these super short videos as bell ringers at the beginning of class or just assign them to students who need them. And it's very likely you can get them free through your university or county library. And they have the text backup you need to show videos and still be ADA compliant. Just search for Grammar Girl at LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com and choose the Better Writing course. Today is Thanksgiving, the U.S. holiday that many people jokingly call Turkey Day. That's because most people celebrate the occasion by baking a turkey, the domesticated version of a member of the pheasant and grouse family native to the Americas. Why do we call this bird a turkey? Well, it's a case of mistaken identity. For centuries before Europeans came to North America, Turkish traders were importing African guinea fowl into Europe. The birds were known as turkey cocks. When North American traders started to import our bird from the Americas into Europe, they were sometimes mistaken for turkey cocks. And then they came to be known as turkeys, and the name stuck. So yes, the bird turkey is named after the country turkey, even though they don't actually come from Turkey. We also have a number of phrases and idioms that use the word turkey. First off, we have the expression to talk turkey. This means to speak plainly or to get down to business. For example, if someone is hedging about whether they want to go out with you, you might say, let's talk turkey. Do you like me or not? When you talk turkey, you get right to the point. You tell the plain truth. The origin is complicated, but it may have come from a story in the 1800s about a white man who tried to keep all the turkeys for himself when he went hunting with a Native American, who was having none of it. Another expression is to go cold turkey. This means to stop something abruptly, without planning or pacing yourself. It originally referred to withdrawal from an addictive substance like alcohol or drugs, but now it can refer to anything. You could say, I stopped sleeping late, cold turkey, if you decided to wake up every day at 5 a.m. and started doing so the next day. The Oxford English Dictionary says that Canadians first used the term in 1921, and the citation does not make it sound pleasant. It reads like this. Perhaps the most pitiful figures who have appeared before Dr. Carlton Simon are those who voluntarily surrender themselves. When they go before him, they're given what is called the cold turkey treatment. When you look at how often the phrase is used in published books, though, it didn't seem to take off until around 1965. It's also far more common in American English than in British English. Nobody seems to be quite sure how the phrase cold turkey came to describe this kind of extreme sudden quitting. The Oxford Dictionary of English Idioms says, quote, The image is one of the possible unpleasant side effects of this, involving bouts of shivering and sweating that cause goose flesh or goose pimples, a bumpy condition of the skin which resembles the flesh of a dead, plucked turkey, unquote. We can also call a person a turkey. When we say that, we mean they're a real wash-up, a bad egg, a loser. When we refer to some thing being a turkey, we mean that it's a dud or a flop. It's disappointing or of little value. For example, we might say the awful movie we went to see was a real turkey. And if our friends hogged all the popcorn and talked through the whole movie, that they were turkeys too. The negative meaning of turkey likely comes from the fact that domesticated turkeys are not the brightest of creatures. Male turkeys, in fact, will attack anything that looks even vaguely like a threat, including their own reflections. There's also such a thing as a turkey shoot. 
This phrase is based on an old type of shooting match held in the U.S. in which turkeys were both the targets and the prizes. It sounds quite unsporting. The turkeys were usually tied up so they were easy to shoot. Thus, a turkey shoot means anything that's super easy to do. Specifically, it refers to a battle in which one side wins with little difficulty, usually with massive bloodshed on the other side. And here's a final fact for the day. You may have heard of the turkey buzzard, another bird native to the Americas. Well, it's not the same thing as a turkey. Turkey buzzards do not have pretty tails and soft brown feathers. They have a coal-black coat and a bare, wrinkly, reddish-headed neck. More important, they do not eat cute piles of corn. They eat dead things, preferably things that have died recently. In other words, they're carrion vultures. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Before we get to Cornucopia, you won't be surprised to hear that I believe in the power of education. We should all have the opportunity to learn from dedicated, passionate teachers who break things down in clear, comprehensible language. But I know that today, many students suffer because they don't have access to a great education. And that's one of the reasons I find Teach for America so inspiring. TFA lets college graduates and professionals make an immediate, powerful difference in the lives of students across the country. There are so many stories of leaders who've gone through TFA using their experience, skills, creativity, and passion to champion the kids they teach, all while growing as a professional and as a person. To learn more about how you can join this network of 60,000 leaders who've helped redefine the future for kids in the classroom and beyond, visit teachforamerica.org slash grammargirl today, and you'll also get a free guide on how to pursue a purpose-driven career. That's teachforamerica.org slash grammargirl. This episode is also brought to you by Hallmark Cards. Your mom is one of those people you can give a Hallmark birthday card and it doesn't go unnoticed. I know this sounds too good to be true, but you might remember a couple of weeks ago I told you my stepmom loves Hallmark, gets all her cards from Hallmark. Well, she just had a birthday and I got her a Hallmark card. And when she opened it, she let out a little gasp and said, Hallmark! She loved it, and my dad even emailed me that night and said, good job on the card. I kid you not. So Hallmark has so many cards, I can always find a Hallmark card that sounds like me, or one that I know will remind her of a great memory we have together, one that makes her smile. They had really good stepmom cards, and it was the perfect way to let her know how much she matters to me. So give it a try. Nothing says I love you quite like a Hallmark card. See what a card can do to make the next birthday the best one yet. Visit hallmark.com slash grammar to shop a wide variety of birthday cards and use the promo code grammar to get 20% off your card purchase. That's hallmark.com slash grammar and the promo code grammar for 20% off your card purchase. Keeping with our Thanksgiving theme, we often decorate for this holiday with a cornucopia, a curved horn-shaped basket filled with goodies like grapes, apples, and corn. It's a symbol of fruitfulness and abundance. But what's with the word cornucopia, and where did its symbolism come from? To answer those questions, we have to wade into the world of Greek mythology. I hope you're ready, because this one's a little strange. Let's start with Zeus. Most of you know who he is. The most powerful of the Greek gods lives on Mount Olympus, fights with lightning and thunder. Zeus was the son of two titans, Rhea and Kronos. They were the children of Uranus and Gaia. Uranus represented the earth, Gaia the heavens. Yes, that means that Rhea and Kronos were brother and sister and husband and wife. That's just how they did things in Greek mythology. And it gets weirder. Kronos was told by his parents that he would one day be overthrown by his own child. So to be safe, when he and Rhea started having children, he decided to eat them. (laughs) Totally normal. One by one, he chowed down on Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, and Poseidon. Then Rhea had Zeus. 
By this time, she was tired of all her children being eaten alive. So she swaddled up a stone and tricked Kronos into eating it instead of baby Zeus. Good thinking, Rhea. Next, Rhea took Zeus and hid him away in a cave, high in the white mountains of Crete, and she left him in the care of a foster mother, Amalthea. Depending on which version of the myth you follow, Amalthea was either a goat who nursed Zeus or a nymph who let Zeus feed from her pet goat. Either way, Zeus grew up fat and happy, full of goat's milk, and warmed by the soft winds of the Mediterranean. And here's where we get back to the cornucopia. One day, Amalthea's goat accidentally broke off one of her horns. Amalthea cleaned it up, filled it with flowers and fruit, and gave it to Zeus. In gratitude, Zeus placed the goat and the horn among the stars, creating the constellation Capricornus. Capricorn comes from two Latin words, caprum, meaning goat, and cornu, meaning horn. Thus, Capricornus, or Capricorn as we say it today, means goat-horned. Cornucopia also uses the root cornu, meaning horn. The second part of the word, copiae, means plenty. Thus, cornucopia literally means horn of plenty. We see these two roots in other words we know, too. There's unicorn, meaning one-horned, and copious, meaning plentiful and abundant. In another version of this myth, it was Zeus who broke the horn off the goat. He gave it to Amalthea and her sisters, and he endowed it with the power to instantly fill with whatever the holder wished for. Thus, this version even more strongly associates the cornucopia with the idea of endless abundance. And finally, just for the record, there's an alternate story about the origin of the constellation Capricorn. A different Greek myth tells of the deity Pan trying to escape from the horrible monster Typhon, a beast with a hundred snake heads and poisonous venom. Pan is usually depicted as a man with the hindquarters, legs, and horns of a goat. But apparently, he could also change shape. In trying to escape from Typhon, he leapt through some water. At one point, his front half turned full goat, while his back half turned into a fishtail. Thus, the constellation Capricorn is often shown as a goat with the tail of a fish. Greek mythology is full of stories like this, some that agree, some that contradict each other. You could say it's a veritable cornucopia of tall tales. Listeners, enjoy your turkey day. I hope your cornucopia is full and you find much to be thankful for today and always. That segment was also written by Samantha Enslin. Thanks, Sam. Finally, a reader named Serena wrote in with this wonderful follow-up to the episode we did about words that make people cringe, like the word moist. She wrote, quote, Your post today reminded me of my family's reaction. While vacationing in Costa Rica last winter, every time we saw a billboard for the Costa Rican department store's new line of swimsuits and other clothing. It was called, in English, moist. We just couldn't get over it. The word aversion Americans have to the word was not known, apparently, to the advertiser, but it was certainly felt by us, unquote. Thanks, Serena. That is hilarious. It's a fabulous example of a translation project where maybe they got the words right, but they definitely missed the cultural nuance. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me at the home of my podcast network, quickanddirtytips.com, where you can also find all the other great Quick and Dirty Tips podcast hosts, including Nutrition Diva, Money Girl, and The Get Fit Guy. Thanks to my producer, Nathan Sims, and that's all. Thanks for listening. Wow.